This week on Headline Crime, new information in the murder of Rachel Morin. Police have released new details, a new sketch, and are looking for tips. Now we have a murder. Are there other unsolved murders that might be connected? A teenager in Nevada has allegedly murdered her father and brother, saying she couldn't control the urge to kill. Also today on Headline Crime, a somber anniversary as we remember the lives of 13-year-old Abby Williams and 14-year-old Libby German best friends who went missing seven years ago on February 13th, 2017. Their bodies were discovered the next day. What the families are doing to make sure no one forgets their girls and a way you can help too. All that and more just ahead on Headline Crime. Good evening. This is Headline Crime. Literally a year ago, Parents Weekend, we were celebrating these amazing kids that we would raised. Everyone becomes a suspect and no one trusts anyone. Justice has never been obtained in that case. Court documents are revealing what Brian Laundrie's parents knew after her death. Welcome everyone to Headline Crime, your weekly true crime briefing. I'm Susan Hendricks. You may know me from my many years at CNN and HLN, as well as my extensive true crime coverage. And I'm Dan Simitovich. Perhaps you know me or my voice from the hit podcast, Down the Hill, The Delphi Murders. We're here to bring you the most essential true crime headlines and arm you with everything you need to know about today's biggest stories. If that sounds good to you, please subscribe to the channel and hit that like button. This week, we're going to spend some time talking about the big picture of the Delphi murders. But first, let's jump into this week's biggest crime headlines. And Dan, we start with a horrific scene in Reno, Nevada, where Mashenka Reed, a 17-year-old girl, is accused of killing her father and younger brother and then trying to kill her sister and then calling 911 on herself. On February 9th, a 911 dispatcher received a call from a man who said he heard gunshots nearby and calls for help. Shortly after that, 911 received another call from a girl who said this, quote, I shot my dad and then I shot my brother. When the 911 dispatcher asked Mashenka what happened, she allegedly replied, I just couldn't control the urge to kill somebody. According to the official report, Mashenka dropped the gun in her apartment and was waiting outside. Police took the teen into custody and searched the home where they found the bodies of both her brother and father. Mashenka's sister was found in one of the bedrooms too, but she was not harmed. According to official filings, she told investigators that she intended to kill her sister, but wasn't able to get into that locked room. She allegedly told investigators that after her mother left the family in December, she began having dark thoughts, saying it slowly got worse every day. Mashenka Reed is charged with two counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. Our top crime headline, police believe they now know what the man who killed 37-year-old Rachel Morin looks like. Her body was discovered on August 5th, 2023, near a popular trail in Hartford, Maryland. Investigators say the mother of five was exercising on the Mon Pa Heritage Trail just north of Baltimore that summer day, and she never made it home. Rachel's boyfriend called to report her missing, and police immediately started searching. Rachel's car was found at the trailhead, but she was nowhere to be found. The next morning, Rachel's body was found in a drainage culvert that lines the trail. Her brother says, as the days go on, it just gets more difficult. In a recent podcast from the Harford County Sheriff's Department, the case's lead investigator says that he believes Rachel was attacked on the trail and killed in that culvert. That area of the trail... There was a bend in the in the trail that most likely was was used by the individual who committed this crime, who attacked Rachel on the trail, pulled her through the wooded area into these uh, um, into this drainage uh, culvert where she ultimately lost her life. He believes the killer knew the area pretty well and was perhaps even familiar with Rachel, who was often there. This person obviously took the time to be familiar with the area because he was familiar with the culverts we spoke of. And he was also most likely or potentially familiar with Rachel. By piecing together witness statements from people who were out there that day, authorities believe that Rachel was only briefly out of view when she was attacked. Police believe that this crime was planned, the locations and methods chosen ahead of time, but they still don't know whether or not Rachel was the target or this was a random attack. 
But the Harford County Sheriff says that in his gut, he believes the killer was specifically after Rachel. Police recovered DNA evidence from the scene and were able to link it to an unsolved crime out of Los Angeles. The DNA was matched to a hat that was left behind during a March 2023 assault at home invasion. And this is key here. A man is seen leaving that California home. He's caught on surveillance footage but you can only see his back and part of his side as he walks away from that California home. Police hope that someone will recognize him from the footage they do have. There are still many questions, including how and why the perpetrator was in Los Angeles in March and Maryland in August, or where he could be living now. Investigators are relying on the public, you, to help, asking people to call in if they have any information on the man they're looking for. They're hoping that these recently released sketches will generate some new leads. They used the surveillance footage from Los Angeles and witness statements from both crime scenes to come up with the composites. If you know who this person is or have a tip to share, call the Harford County Sheriff's Office at 410-836-7788 or send an email to the address on your screen, rmtips at harfordsheriff.org. And trial attorney and legal analyst Misty Maris is with us to talk more about this ongoing investigation. Misty, that DNA link here is huge in the case. It's actually unbelievable, Susan, because uh, it's it's something that was such a mystery uh, with Rachel. And now to be able to make that connection and in fact, take it a step further that there's now a public sketch, something that's out there in the public sphere to help identify this person. What was interesting about the match of the DNA to this completely unrelated uh, crime is that no name has been attached. So this person was not actually identified in these uh, platforms and systems which would keep that information, the Cody system for those who, who aren't familiar with that term. But even still, even without a name, it's giving a lot of information in order to track this person down, potentially make an arrest, or at least find more leads in the course of this investigation. So he's not in the system, therefore it's assumed that this person hadn't been caught for a crime or committed a crime enough to be in the CODA system? Right. So there was a crime scene. DNA is, of course, um, w- during the investigation, DNA is extracted from the crime scene. DNA is processed from the crime scene. That DNA goes into these systems so that if there are other crimes, uh, that it could be identified as a match. Now, if that person had been arrested, if that person had been booked, if that person had been charged, a name would be attached. There would be more information there in order to make that positive identification. But this came one step short. But even still, that's why these national database platforms are so important for law enforcement, both local law enforcement, uh, federal law enforcement, because it does help to make those connections when we're talking about crimes that occur over state lines. It gives more resources to local investigators. You know, what surprises me about this is that, uh, you know, clearly this is a violent person who is intentional in his acts, right? Then we go all the way across the country to Maryland, where police say in just in the podcast that they had this, this last week where they released some new details, that they believe that this person was very familiar with the area of this, you know, this, this somewhat rural county in, in, in Maryland. You know, he was probably planning this crime and he may even have been targeting specifically uh, Rachel. What boggles my mind is that there's been no warnings about safety to the community, right? Like this person obviously is a violent person with violent intent. Like, do you think, do you, do you think that there should be more of a, a concern about this? Well, of course there should be a concern, a concern about that, especially since we know that the DNA, it's a match, right? And so to the extent that we have a very, very violent crime, as you said, committed in California, and then we're talking about the other coast and another violent crime. And to your point, uh, the sheriff of Maryland had said that their hunch, you know, they didn't give dispositive information about this, but the hunch is that this person was following, stalking, tracking Rachel in order to be at the place where she was the most vulnerable on that day. So to your point, yes, of course, there does need to be a degree of this is a dangerous, violent person and everybody should be on watch. And maybe with 
the uh, this new sketch that there's more information coming out to lead to identify this person. Uh, I think you're right. Maybe that maybe there did need to be one step further. But you know what? Like now that I think about it, you know, if Los Angeles is point A and and Maryland is point Z, what happens between point B and Y, right? Well, like, and that's the problem. Yeah, because, and that's the problem when you have these multi-jurisdictional offenders. Yeah. You don't necessarily have that nucleus of local or even state law enforcement who is on the pulse of that particular individual because we know that this person at some point traveled. We don't know how, we don't know where the other stops were or if there were any in between. Sure. All we know is that we have this match and the next step needs to come. Now, it doesn't mean that this person is guilty, right? You're right. you're innocent until proven guilty, but there's obviously a strong push to make a clear identity of this individual. And that's based on those DNA matches. So uh, the DNA goes a long way. Is it always dispositive? No, can't, but it really depends on what else comes out during the investigation. Step one, find this individual. And they absolutely need the public's help because considering, as you mentioned, Dan, Maryland and Los Angeles, is this person traveling? Could he even be out of the country? So the connection between law enforcement really needs to occur. And I've noticed the sheriff doing a lot of media because he wants everyone to know about this case saying, look, we now have a sketch. We have stills of him leaving this home in Los Angeles, and we need your help because he could really be anywhere, Misty. Absolutely. And that's why we're seeing this getting such national attention. It isn't local. Uh, this sketch is being released and there's a significant reward. What's it up to $35,000 now uh, in order for information to be provided to law enforcement. And if that information is credible and leads to something that ultimately results in catching this person and arresting this person, that's where that reward comes in. Now, rewards have a twofold effect. If you're the LAPD or if you're the Harford County Sheriff's Department, are you on the phone with other agencies or the FBI or whomever, like, you know, in between the coasts, right? Trying to find out if there are similar MOs or similar cases for a person with such a, a geographic diversity of crime. Like it, it just, to me, it's, it's scary that this person could be anywhere, right? You hit the nail on the head, it's modus operandi. So looking at cases, through the use of federal agencies, which are likely, if they might be in the shadows, but they're likely engaged at this point, that you have these uh, very similar uh, MOs across the country, right? You have victims, uh, victims who were targeted when they were vulnerable, you have violent crime. You may have federal agencies, or as you said, law enforcement that's connected across the country, which would have to be federal, looking into this and identifying whether or not there are other crimes that have not been solved that might be on the path. Look, they're always going to know a little more than we know as the public in a case like this, right? They're always going to have a bit more information than we do. Yeah. Uh, and and so to the extent that they have some leads or, or relate, leads relating to those types of things, modus operandi, that could be similar either in that area or on a path to that area, which is literally everywhere. It's because it's across the country, right? It's coast to coast. There's no doubt they're looking at it. it reminds me of Rex Heurman, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Long Island serial killer now, or alleged, alleged. Long Island yeah. serial killer, I should say, just mm -hmm. to, to be fair. But we, as we know, local law enforcement for many, many years was unable to put together the pieces. Then the FBI gets engaged. There's a task developed. And now there's been, uh, there, there's an investigation in South Carolina, that which you know, that started in New York. So of course, in these types of cases, these horrible, horrible facts, here we have a murder. To the extent there's other unsolved cases, it's absolutely possible that there's collaboration between departments, both local and federal. Yeah, I mean, just defi almost definitionally, you know, this person is a serial offender, if it is the same person who has committed both of these crimes. And, you know, I, I fear like with, with some of these offenders, Police almost sometimes have to wait for it to happen again until they get the next usable lead. That's that's kind of scary. Do you think that the communication, Misty, through the years has gotten better? It has gotten much better. And the resources of local, uh, local law enforcement and in communication and in the sharing of DNA, like we were just talking about through these databases, through electronic footprint, uh, through other means of 
really being able to share information in such a faster way than was previously available and more dispositive, right? If looking at camera footage, if you can find and identify someone, even if now this is very public, well, there's the possibility that someone could say, I don't know who this person is, but I caught them on my ring doorbell or I caught them on footage outside my store. And it's, it's such a different world now with respect to what you can find and the technology that is available and easily, easily shared within seconds with law enforcement, as opposed to the more laborious task of putting that all together in these multi-jurisdictional cases where there really aren't those resources. And then you factor in federal resources like the FBI or other uh, federal law enforcement investigatory arms, and you have just even more resources at your disposal and more information available that could help to identify a person like this. And, and to your point, Dan, we don't know what happened in LA, what stopped short of that becoming a murder, right? And, and then now we have a murder. Are there other unsolved murders that might be connected? So all of that is going to be factored into law enforcement's analysis. And they're, they're pushed to really find this person, identify them, start the process of uh, you know, continuing the investigation and, and seeing where that goes and ultimately finding justice for these families. You mentioned technology, Misty, evolving so much so with the ring doorbell. That's where we're able to see these images, although it's just from his back, him leaving that home in Los Angeles. They're spooky as hell. Those Has, are spooky they, as hell. They really you are. Know, I heard somewhere there's a whole YouTube channel just dedicated to creepy ring doorbell videos. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't want to get anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll never leave my house again. Wow, yeah. Yeah, I have seen one of them of a man just wanting to get in and saying he was going to come in and what he was going to do to the woman inside. It really was what nightmares are made of seeing that. In terms of evolving, do you think it's evolved when it comes to jurors? Of, of course, the technology, I believe, has. But let's talk about the DNA. I always go back to the O.J. Simpson case where it appeared, not being a fault of her own, where Marsha Clark lost the jurors in terms of describing what DNA was. There's more of an understanding of it now, I believe. Have you seen that being a trial attorney? Absolutely. So much of an understanding. And it's almost that it went the other way. The pendulum swung all the way up here. And I think a lot of that is because with all the the NCIS world, right? All of these uh, all of these shows and just that kind of normalizes that DNA process in criminal cases. Many jurors expect to see DNA. Mm. They expect it. They expect to see something that's more of a dispositive link. Which is why when we talk about cases that are largely circumstantial, they're a bit more tricky because that link of the DNA is missing and almost has to be explained away to the jurors because the expectation is that there will be some DNA. Jurors want to see DNA. They do feel that DNA is something more objective, whereas in a circumstantial case, it can be more on the line as far as which way the case tips, depending on the totality of the evidence. But I do think DNA, the understanding of it, and it's less, you know, how many trials have we covered together? Susan, I mean, so many trials, we've covered gavel to gavel. And it's always, you know, the DNA, the expert is up there and it can be a little dry, but people find it very fascinating now. Yeah. I mentioned and that a lot, the battle of the experts, and you and I have seen that. And I wonder if DNA is absolute, or now you mentioning the different types of DNA, if you can explain it away. Yeah, so it's it's not absolute. And, and that's that's what makes all of these cases so different and so interesting and very unique. And every single circumstance is going to be different. So with respect to DNA, when you have a match, the first question is, what is that? What po percentage of the population does that eliminate? Right. Is it less than if this match? It's like less than one percent of people have this. Right. And so then if you've got a match with the person that's sitting in that defense side, you're like, OK, well, then it can be extrapolated. It's one in a hundred thousand, whatever it might be, those percentages will be presented depending on the type of DNA, the nature of the DNA, when it was collected, you know, older cases, you don't really see uh, the, the more dispositive matches, you see the more extrapolated analysis. But now with technology, we can get DNA that's 20 years old. Nothing's really 100% in trial, but boy, oh boy, does it help to have DNA in addition to um, you know, the means and manner of death, along with DNA, 
and all of those questions answered, it goes a long way with the jury. Ms. Demiris, you're the best. And we thank you so much for joining us. Um, why don't you tell everybody where they could find you and anything you may have going on? Yeah, absolutely. So I appear on various television networks. Uh, I post all my appearances on at Misty Maris Esquire on Instagram and at Misty Maris on Twitter. Thank you so much for having me. Misty, thanks. Seven years ago this week, 13-year-old Abigail Williams at 14-year-old Liberty German of Delphi, Indiana, went for an afternoon walk on a popular trail and disappeared. They didn't make it back to the trailhead, the meeting place where Libby's dad was waiting to drive them home. Family and friends knew from a snapshot of Abby walking on the Monon High Bridge, an abandoned railway line that soars above Deer Creek, that the girls were there on the high bridge. But when they didn't show up or answer any calls, they were officially declared missing and a search party began looking. Sadly, the next day, their bodies were discovered about a quarter mile from the bridge. A massive police investigation then begins, and not much in the way of details is made public. We do learn early on that Libby had managed to use her phone to record a 43 second long video that ends with a man approaching them and saying, Over time, images and sound of that are released to the public along with a couple of very different looking sketches based on witness statements. Police ask for tips and thousands pour in. For long periods of time, there is very little new information released, but the pleas to the public from law enforcement continued. If you think you recognize the man on the bridge, they said, call in. No tip is too little, or it may seem insignificant, may be important to us. Some took it too far though, Dan, as you know, and it turned ugly. Many innocent people were accused of being the so-called bridge guy. Side-by-sides were posted online, based on nothing but a hunch. Accusations were made and theories were formed and fought for. Then, almost six years after the murders, in 2022, Richard Allen of Delphi, Indiana, was arrested and charged with the murder of Abby and Libby. He is currently scheduled to go on trial this year. Now, if you've been tuned into this story, you know that we're in a phase where each new turn and each new week seems to be more wild than the last. And there are strong opinions out there on whether or not Alan is responsible. We've covered that here and will continue to, but that's not what we're going to do today. This week, we want to look back to what makes this horrible crime so compelling to so many and talk about the people who have lived this. Susan and I have spent a lot of time covering that. For Susan, it was primarily through her coverage for HLN, CNN, and her book, Down the Hill. For me, it was primarily through my podcast of that same name. So Susan, when did Delphi and the story of the murders first hit your radar? Well, it was breaking news to us, Dan. I was on the set. It was 2017 when their bodies were discovered. And I interviewed Ron Logan, whose property the bodies were discovered on. And I was on the set and I heard him in my ear. I was speaking to him, uh, paraphrasing. You talked to Ron that day. It was February 14th when the bodies were discovered. Yeah. 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 The next day, and he just couldn't believe it. And he said, you know, my sons grew up here. They go down there all the time. I can't believe that this happened in Delphi. And that's what everyone felt. And Becky said to me time and time again that she was so moved as soon as they were declared missing and the authorities were out there. Essentially, she said it felt like the entire town of Delphi was down there. And you just saw this kind of orange glow that was glowing for people not giving up, looking for those girls. And she was trying to stay positive. But as it got colder and as the hours went on, she thought, this isn't good. But trying again to stay positive and being there for Kelsey and Tara and leaning on each other. And of course, for Abby's mom, who she was at work and thought, okay, the girls are missing. And she even said, look, I thought, okay, Abby's in trouble. She's not allowed to go down there. So no one thought that the outcome would be what it was. Then in 2019, when I was sent there by HLN to cover the story, meeting Kelsey, uh, meeting Mike, meeting Becky, really getting to know the families. It changed my perspective and it changed me as a journalist. Yeah, in 2019, which is you know two years after the murder, that's the first time that you went to Delphi, right? Like, was it April? Was it for the New Direction presser? No, it was before that. It was yeah. in February, but it, it hadn't yet been two years. It was right before that time. Sure. And Kelsey accompanied us to the bridge. And I remember it being freezing. Yeah, I remember all the, all the leaves were gone. Yeah, 19 degrees. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. she even said to me, 
kind of in a whisper as we're walking down to the bridge, I wish it was this cold that day. Because it was so warm, they were able to go down there. That makeup snow day from school that they felt, okay, it's warm enough. We want to be outside. Becky said, hey, they were going to be off their devices that everyone has. So, hey, why not going outside? I know I grew up going outside. I'm sure you did too, Dan. Never thinking that the worst possible scenario would play out. When did you first hear of this? I remember you and I had went to Delphi about a year and a half later together. So when was your first time hearing of this? Yeah, but I my, I always had a sort of background knowledge uh, of it. You know, at the time, I, you know, we were both working for, uh, you were working for CNN and HLN, and I was sort of working for the parent company, which at the time was Turner. And what my job was, you know, I was, I was making podcasts for all the different Turner brands, like, you know, TNT, Bleacher Report, CNN. And, you know, HLN approached us and said, we want to do our first true crime podcast. And, you know, what story should we do? We kicked around a couple and, 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 and Delphi came up and I'm like, that's the one with the with the guy on the bridge, right? And they're like, yeah, like, we're doing that one. Because from what little I knew of it, just the very top level, high level sort of story of it it almost seemed like a real life ghost story right like there was this mysterious person uh you know and, and lurking was, on the bridge was, yeah and you know so that's the one we decided to do and after that i really started learning about it and getting into it and the more i learned about it the more it affected me and the first time I went to Delphi was, I believe, in August of 2019. So just a few months after that New Direction presser, which I think was the, the, the you know, you had been there. You know, that first visit, you know, we spent a lot of time with the families and Kelsey and learning and getting to know Delphi. You know, we, if you haven't been to Delphi, it's literally a, you know, sort of the downtown is a two block area, right? You have the courthouse in the middle, very small town, America. Main Street, Main literally. Street. My favorite place to eat there is a stone house grill. Like we go there for breakfast all the time. And if you are ever in Delphi and you go to the stone house, uh, the cinnamon raisin French toast is, it's amazing. And they have great uh, grits and gravy. Anyway, yeah. I, I digress. I'm thinking about it now. I kind of want to- small town USA, it really is. And yes, with amazing food. And uh, also during that trip, you know, Kelsey, uh, we went out to that bridge with Kelsey and Doug. What Carp. were your thoughts when first approaching? Yeah. Um, you know, you see the pictures, you see the video and you, you know, you have an image of your mind, like it's kind of spooky, but that day it was a summer day when it's beautiful out. Right. And you get out to the bridge itself and you see all these lush trees and you hear the water from Deer Creek below. And, you know, it's a very peaceful scene. And it's, we all kind of stood there for a second, just taking it in before we did anything. I tried to imagine them on the bridge mm-hmm. and the guy on the bridge and like just kind of painting that picture in my head. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was really at odds with this peaceful scene I was, st- I was standing in. But, you know, once, you know, I try to put myself in that place in time. Yeah, you feel it. We were there with uh, Doug Carter's superintendent of the Indiana State Police. And he went out on the bridge to do the interview a little bit, just not out on the bridge, but a little. And I, and I, I had to go out there and stand on, mm-hmm. stand on platforms with a microphone and the entire time like if you the bridge is rickety right you know the, the rails with lots of spacing between it so if you even glance down you see this it's frightening one, it's yeah, terrifying hundred foot drop below you you know you can't move quickly on that bridge so you, you have to be very deliberate in the way you step and like that was something that you know you, you, i just thought about like this was all a very slow moving thing while they were on that bridge because it had to be right yeah so uh but yeah, no, that was a very profound, profound moment just getting mm-hmm. there and understanding and seeing the place and getting to know the families. We actually went over to Mike and Becky's house for, I believe it was Labor Day. And, you know, I, I got to meet the, the, you know, the larger family as well, right? Um, large, lots of members of the family. And I shucked beans for the first time. And I had something called a, I believe it was a Frito pie. Uh, and it was good. Um, and Mike and barbecue, man. Uh, I'll tell you that Mike, Mike Patty can barbecue, but. And that's exactly my experience. Becky served us cobbler when I was there and mm-hmm. the spaghetti meat sauce I'm still dreaming of. Going back to the bridge, I felt the opposite of what you felt. And maybe really? it's the time of year. I didn't feel peaceful at all. It was very unnerving for me and it was very, it was terrifying. But what I did, I kind of pictured Abby on the bridge and that Snapchat, but I also pictured the man on the bridge and thinking that someone had to be from here to be on the bridge. 
because I knew what had happened there and maybe because it was 19 degrees below and I was alone my first 20 feet, I turned back fairly quickly, about 30 feet, and then uh, Kelsey joined me. And I remember going back to Mike's house and he said, Kelsey's grandfather, were you okay? Because they were worried and now she goes back every year. And this year she posted the seven year anniversary, our annual walk. And to her, I believe it's about strength. I talked about it being terrifying, peaceful. For her, it's, I'm continuing to live. I'm remembering Libby, but I'm not letting this guy take me to. So now as Kelsey put it so eloquently, on her post seven years after the fact saying, can't believe it's February again, praying this is a year of resolution. There's a gag order. They're not able to talk, but I believe they speak through their posts, essentially saying, we miss you, posting pictures of the girls. If you want a way that you can help, if you're wondering what can we do, show your support, I believe, by posting pictures of the girls or just reaching out to Becky on Facebook and saying, we're here for you. And also, there are ways through the Abbey and Libby Memorial Park, and we both have memories of that as well, right? It started out as an idea for a softball field and grew into so much more. Yeah, I remember being out there when it was just an idea. Uh, it, I was out there with Mike Patty, uh, and at that point, it was just a big dirt field with a railroad track kind of running in the back, and you can see some silos. And But he laid out his vision for it, and you know, he could see it. It's like it existed for him. And couple of years later, here we are. It does exist, but they still need help maintaining it, continuing to grow it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you go to Abby and Libby Memorial Park dot org, you can find ways that you can help with pavers. And one more memory of that. I remember watching Anna Abby's mom speak to Rafael Sanchez, local news anchor there and saying, oh, this is going to be so cool when it was the amphitheater saying, Abby would have loved this. The amphitheater, that was my one thing. I said, that would be the coolest. Give these kids place to play their music. It's a beautiful place. To the moms, the grandmothers, the extended family, the girl's memory, keeping it alive is so important for them. And their pictures are there and you kind of feel their spirit there. You're able also to buy a paver. You could buy one in respect to someone that you lost and you love or a message to Abby and Libby, their families. It's a way that will be permanently placed in that park through a paver and you could pick the message on there. Again, go to Abby and Libby Memorial Park org for ways to help. And you know what, before we wrap up, I just, I just want to say that in all this news that we get every day and every week about Delphi, about legal filings, about judges and attorneys at war, about guilt or innocence of Richard Allen, about the latest legal maneuverings, about this theory and that theory. Sometimes it's easy to forget, and I get caught up in it too. I'll be the first to admit it, but it's easy to forget that when it comes down to it, this is something that is about real people, about families, about a town, and most importantly, about two girls who were killed and their lives were cut short. That's Abby and Libby. So let's just take a moment to remember them and remember who they were and appreciate who they were. And that does it today for Headline Crime. We do appreciate you being here and spending time with us. I'm Susan Hendricks. And I'm Dan Sematovich. If you like what we're doing here, show your like, please, by hitting like. Go ahead, do it right now. We'll wait. Also, subscribe, comment, and share the link with your friends. That's going to really help us grow, and we can do that with your help. Also, please follow us on social. All the links are in the description below. I'm personally about to jump headfirst into TikTok. I'll either succeed <laughs> or I'll fail. Either way, it will be spectacular. Wish me luck. I'm going for you. Thank you. And we will see you next week. Until then, please take care. See you then. <laughs>